Okay, here is uh, our, our next uh, talk is coming. As we were discussing on this workshop, if you train neural networks with different starting points, then are we getting consistent future presentations? Are we learning features in a consistent way? Our speaker is uh, Yishuan Liu from Cornell, and she's going to shed more light on this problem. She will explain uh, how can we tell which features are learned consistently using different uh, starting points to train neural networks, and which features are not consistent. Uh, please welcome Yishuan. introduction. Uh, so I'm Ishwan from Cornell University. Today we're going to explore together the question of convergent learning. Do different networks learn the same representations? Deep neural networks have recently been working very well, which has prompted active investigation to the representations that are learned in the middle of the network. This investigation is hard because it requires making sense of millions of learned parameters. But it's also valuable because any understanding we, we acquire promises, uh, promises to help us build and create better models. So I want to start the talk with the teaser question of whether uh, representations learned in different networks are local or distributed. What we mean by local here is that certain concept <coughs> or semantic meaning can be encoded by a single neuron here. And this is the idea of the Jennifer Aniston neuron that Demons and others have talked about this week, where a single neuron would fire for her images. In contrast, in the distributed case, the, uh, the concept of Jennifer Aniston is not represented by any single neuron, but, the, uh, but instead the entire collection of the neural activations. And Shagadi et al. have argued for a distributed representation on the second uh, last layer in the network. Or it could also be somewhere in the middle, where neurons learn to span all low dimensional subspaces, and the represent representations are actually distributed across some units, but not all of them. So what we like to do in this study is to investigate which type of representation are actually being used in different networks. And the key idea of this study is to probe for the presence or absence for each of the representation strategy by training and comparing multiple networks starting at different random initializations. For example, if the local codes are being used, we would expect to, to see the feature learned in one network to be relearned in the other network, and this may be subject to a position permutation. In the distributed case, the units may only be used as the basis vectors to span the entire representation space and the basis vectors of one network may be the rotated version of the other. And in the partially distributed case, we would expect to see the low dimensional subspaces that are always spanned, but the basis vectors might be rotated in that subspace. So to build this another way, in the local case, we would expect to, uh, to see that the basis vectors for both networks to be almost perfectly aligned. And in the partially distributed case, we would <coughs> expect to see rotations through low dimensional subspaces for one net versus the other, for example, in two out of three dimensions. And in fully distributed case, we expect an arbitrary rotation through all feature dimensions. In this study, we use the AlexNet architecture and train on ImageNet with, uh, train on ImageNet. We train the networks here, Net1 and Net2, with the same architecture but different random initializations. And note that they converge to pretty much similar and the first part of the talk will be probing for the presence or absence of the local code. To do this, we will see if we can find uh, units <coughs> that ma match one-to-one -one between two networks. And in order to um, measure the similarity between any two neurons in network, we adopt the statistical correlation. And we feed forward images from ImageNet datasets through both networks. And we look for neurons in one network that is correlated with the neuron in the other network. Just to be clear, we are always uh, comparing neurons in the same, on the same layer and never across different layers. And first, we compute the correlation values for all pairs of neurons for a single layer in one network. 
So for example, COM1 layer in AlexNet has 96 units, and the correlation result could be realized as a square symmetric matrix, which looks like this. And we call this the within net correlation matrix. This matrix is symmetric because we are comparing the sets of units with itself. And the similarity between any uh, single neuron and itself will be exactly <coughs> one, which result in the right diagonals, as you see here. And similarly, we can compute the within that correlation for the outer network. In a similar fashion, we can compute the between that correlation matrix, but in this case, it's not symmetric. And um, the entry line on the ice row and J's column here represents the similarity between ice unit in that one and J's unit in that two. Just as a side, you might be wondering if correlation is, a, is too simple of a measure. Uh, and we wonder this too. So in addition to tri correlation, we also measure the similarity between neurons using mutual information, which can pick up on relationships that might be missed uh, by correlation. However, the short version of the story is all the results are very similar. So for now, we'll just talk about uh, correlation, and you can see the paper for that. OK, now come back to this between a correlation matrix. Well, we are very interested in this matrix, or the bright areas. And this bright entries show us what we are looking for. Each of this bright entry indicates that uh, a neuron in that one and the other neuron in that two that are firing for the same thing. So to find matches between two networks, a straightforward way would be to use greedy matching, where we sim simply pick the max along each of the row of the matrix. And then what we'd like to do is to pick a pair of matching units and virilize their function. To do this, we show for each unit the nine image patches from the validation set that cause the highest activation, as well as the decomp of those each of the nine. So here's the realization of the best match pair in COM1 layer with correlation value as high as one. As you can see, both units here are learning the green objects, and they seem to be perfectly matched. And this is the second best match pair in COM1 layer, and they're both horizontal edges. And you can find many good matches. If we continue the process for all the units in COM1, we can see there are some units, for example here, that have no good match. And the best match for this unit here uh, is this one, but the correlation between them is very low, which is 0 0.28. And we can see qualitatively similar results for COM2 as well. We refined uh, correlated units that are learning spe speckled texture, gray texture, for example, and gray objects. And similarly for COM3, uh, interestingly, we find, for example, here, uh, we find there's a local code represented by a single neuron for the concept of black and white objects. Here, what we've done is to look at each row in this matrix and pick the max entry. This is done with replacement. So it can result in multiple units in that one being paired with the same unit in that two. Alternatively, we could find the best matching without replacement so that every unit in that one uh, in one network has a unique counterpart in the other network. We can do this by finding the max weighted bipartite matching. And this matching allows us to take two networks with units that are not aligned and bring them to the best possible alignment. If we realize the correlation matrix between the aligned matrices networks, it looks like this matrix here. And we can see that some of the diagonal entries are very bright, which indicates for this unit in that one, there exists a unique and highly correlated unit in the other network. So right now we have um, two different methods in finding the matches, greedy matching and bipartite matching. In some cases, the matches will be the same between both methods, in some cases and now. So we can gain additional insight by comparing the matches produced by both methods. And to compare the matches, we plot each unit along the x-axis along with the correlation of its match along the y-axis. And here, for example, is the COM1 layer. The light green dots represents the uh, correlation found by the greeting matching and the uh, dark green dots represents the correlation found by bipartite matching. And we sort this uh, units by their greedy matching correlation value to score clarity. Um, and there are several observations can be drawn from this. Um, 
first, let's look at those high correlation pairs here. Uh, we find that uh, we see that matches found by both methods here coincide for those high correlation pairs. And now if we think back to our um, local versus distributed soft experiment, um, this is what we would expect to see when the local code is being used. And we also see that some of the units in that one have no high correlation match in that two. And this indicates that these features are more unique to one network. And finally, we see that in some cases, when the matches are not the same, the backward time matching is significantly worse. So for example, let's look at let look at this unit here. So there exists a high correlation match in the other network, but it's not assigned to it in the backward time matching. So what do you think happened to this unit here? What do you think happened to this gap? Um, so let's imagine that um, the partially distributed hypothesis is true. And then what we would expect you to see, for example, for example, uh, an intuitive explanation would be that one might learn to span a subspace of human faces using four neurons here, and that two learn to span a similar subspace with three units. And so pretty matching might find this pairings. And with unique bipartite matching, three out of four units from net one may be matched to their best, um, closest counterpart in net two. Although the fourth unit here has a, a very high correlated neuron in net two, but since <coughs> those three units have already been taken, so it ended up being paired with the almost unrelated neuron. So we take this result to be a hint of a, a partially distributed code that may be being used and we'll talk about that more specifically in the next part of the talk. And similar patterns can be observed in other convolutional layers, and you can see the uh, full plots in the paper. So far with this uh, simple method, we found some one-to-one -one matches between units. And we found little evidence that uh, some units use a representation that is partially distributed within small subspaces. But we like to confirm this hypothesis and find those small subspaces. And we can do this by training a mapping layer to predict one network's activation from the other network. And the mapping layer's parameters can be considered as a square matrix with site lengths equal to the number of units in that layer. And the layer learns to predict the activation of any unit in one network uh, via a linear weighted sum of unit activations in the other. So in other words, it's a one-by-one one convolution. If we're more fun, we could add a sparse L1 penalty on the mapping layer, uh, where zero penalty allows the learned um, linear model to be dense, and larger penalty would produce a sparse matrix. So we train the mapping layers for count one through count five layers, and we use the average squared uh, prediction errors to measure the loss. This is the loss trained on count one layer here. Uh, without any sparsity penalty. As we increase the sparsity, the prediction performance is not significantly uh, affected, which implies that the activation of each unit can be predicted by only one or a few neurons in the outer network. And as expected, eventually, when the sparsity is too extreme, the performance drops. And a similar pattern is observed in COM2 layer with slightly higher prediction loss in general. And for COM3 through COM5 layers, the results are a bit trickier and we'll discuss more fully in the paper. Um, so what does the learned sparse mapping layer look like? And this is a realization for the COM1 uh, trained learned sparse matrix. And this matrix contains on average 4.7 entries per line, which is a lot sparser compared to the correlation matrix that we saw before. So let's take a look at a few prediction examples here. For example, if we look at the first unit in that two, uh, which is realized here, you can see this unit is learning some green and magenta edges. And this unit can be predicted by only three units in that one. And the most predictive units in this one, which are which is essentially learning the same colors, but you see the edges are slightly rotated. <coughs> And you can see 
you one more example for this unit here, and it's learning some, it's recognizing some red objects. Now, um, if the sparse prediction results again bring us back to the um, local versus distributed experiment that we uh, posed earlier in this talk, we see that the representation here is actually a mix between a local code and partially distributed code that spans uh, across multiple units. So what we've seen so far is a few to one view, but if the subspace is learned in both networks, um, it will be more of a few to field view mapping. And we can find the field to field mapping use, uh, using hierarchical agglomerative clustering and due to the time limit, I will omit the details for now. And what this algorithm produces is a tree structure where the leaves uh, here are the units from both networks shown in green and red. And the tray is overlaid in this um, blue lines here. And intermediate nodes in the tree contain groups of units that are co-predicted to each other. And this is part of the tree. We can zoom out and see the entire thing here for column one layer. And if we zoom in on the region along the diagonal, we can see a four-dimensional subspace of the edge filters spanned by um, those four units here in that two, and this four unit here in that one. And we can see another example uh, of the span subspace of low frequency edge color detectors here. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, what we studied is, uh, what we conclude so far in the study is, first, some features are learned reliably in multiple networks, yet other features are not consistently learned. And representation codes are a mix between local code and partially distributed code. And thirdly, units learn to span low dimensional subspaces. And while the subspaces are common to multiple networks, the basis vectors learn from them. And we think that local versus distributed investigation is a very interesting research trajectory. And we've only explored the beginning so far. And the next couple of steps um, that will be fun to explore um, might be, for example, we can find the framework for some other architectures such as VGG as well, and we can try a broader diverse set of data sets. And also we'd like to develop a way of distilling the results into a simple fingerprint uh, for any layer to one network, uh, which can show compactly what type of representation is being used. And if you'd like to read more, here's the link to the paper. And I'd also like to acknowledge my sources who have contributed to this work. And please stop by the poster uh, for more. And thank you for listening. this correlation uh, relationship changes uh, between this on-train network networks versus the train network. So thanks for the suggestion. Great, let's thank the speaker again. Uh, so now we invite the poster presenter.